I invite you to turn with me to Romans, and it's a very good morning to you. It's a blessing and pleasure of mine to always be with you on Sundays. And uh, it's also a greater privilege for all of us to have God's word. And as you turn there, just to exhort us to understand something so very important when it comes to our Christian life. And that is that you are all who are born again, ministers, ministers. You have got to cultivate through the word of God and the Holy Spirit living in you as a believer a desire for the lost. And uh, there is a great mistake in um, the notion that um, the only ministers in the church are the pastors, elders, or deacons, or Sunday school teachers, or Um, all those who may be serving on a Sunday morning. The ministry is both on Sunday morning and then Monday through Saturday. And we give you the opportunity as we are church of outreach. It is a fundamental biblical principle which makes it a fundamental desire of ours. And that's us. It's a body of believers to reach out into this city. We have people who are lost. I know many of you are struggling, and I just want to tell you that God did not intend for you to merely survive your Christian life. God has intended for you to thrive throughout your life and to be a powerful witness for the truth of Jesus Christ in the gospel. That's why we posted right above me, as you can see, Acts 1.8, and you will receive power when my Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. That is us together, you and me. We have all of these events. We do them not to make our every member necessarily feel like you've got to be at every one. We understand that um, uh, that would put you in church every day of the week. But we do ask you to invite people to share about the good news that you're learning here at the church each and every week. Go tell people. You guys remember when um, we uh, learned, when I uh, got back from the States, my heart was burdened for um, a biblical truth to be taught, and that is that God has a covenant with Israel. It's not over. And Israel is the epicenter of all world prophecy that will come in the future. I hope you told people about it. I hope you went out into the city. Guys, did you hear about, and and don't think this is just a common thing. There's been underlining hatred for the nation of Iran and Israel um, uh, for a long time. But understand something. They are have declared war to one another, and, and we're going to see what transpires. We talked about this in Ezekiel 38 and, and Daniel 9. Does this mean it's the Ezekiel 38 war? No. There's a, a lot more that, that needs to take place, but it is very interesting with this conflict with Iran and Israel. We talked about this stuff before there was open declaration of war with Iran and Israel. I hope you told people about it. I hope you've been telling people about the book of Romans and the incredible good news that we receive. See, the gospel is good news for us. Invite people. We have Attack on Creation. We had our creation conference. This idea that the earth is billions of years old is not biblical. Um, the idea that the Genesis, uh, Genesis account of 1, 2, and 3 is not a literal account is not biblical. And we're teaching people this. And you go out as the ministers and you tell people all about it. We have this Love the Bible and Change Africa conference. It's been not just a highlight for our church. And uh, if, you've, if you've been to an Love the Bible in Africa, Change Africa Conference. Would you just raise your hand so I can see if you've been to one of these conferences? Really? That's less than half of you. 
So you who did not raise your hand get the privilege of coming to one. These are our incredible conferences. We have so many people that will come that we have to put tents and TVs and speakers outside in order to try to get uh, those who can't fit in this room to hear the word of God in the parking lot as we have some speakers and TVs out there, uh, which is an incentive, by the way, to be on time. Not that you guys have ever been late for anything. Um, we got people from around the world. We have over 60 people, I think, maybe my numbers are wrong, 50 or 60 people from the U.S. coming just for this conference. Um, people from all around African nations. And we as Calvary Chapel, not we as leadership, we as the members get to host such a great event where we have incredible Bible teachers who, who've been teaching the Word of God for decades. I encourage you to come. And I think more of you have been than just raised your hand. Has anybody, you guys remember our, my pastor, your, your grand pastor, Ken Graves? right? It's not fair that God gave him that voice, is it, guys? Any guy that gets on the stage after Pastor Ken is going to sound like a girl. And that's me every time he teaches. It's just not fair. Well, the Apostle Paul goes on about this. Right at the beginning, he says, brethren, my heart's desire in chapter 10 of the book of Romans and prayer it's not just that he desires people to be saved. He's praying for them. My heart's desire and prayer for Israel is that they may be saved. Guys, if you were to pick certain things about the Apostle Paul and say, hey, what are some ways that you could describe him? What, what would you put on his tombstone? You wouldn't begin with how big of a genius he was. You may not even mention it. Maybe some of you don't even know it. The Apostle Paul was a genius. He was essentially the valedictorian of the entire nation of Israel in becoming um, a, a scholar of Judaism. It says even in the Bible that he was above all the students of Judaism of students and Judaism in the world at that time. He was a brilliant man in academics. And yet that's not how we would describe him. Maybe the top two things that you describe him is that he is crucified with Christ. He would say in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but not I. Christ lives in me. And then a very close second is that Paul is extremely passionate when it comes to sharing the gospel with the unbeliever. In other words, number one, he loves the Lord Jesus Christ, and number two, he loves the lost. The lost of Israel and the lost of the pagan world, the Gentile people. He loves them. And we need to ask ourselves, not just that, do, do we as believers love the lost? Are we compromised? Can, can we actually, through a self-evaluation, say that our actions demonstrate that we love the unbeliever and that we are pursuing them no matter how nervous we get, no matter how fearful we get, no matter how much they make fun of us at work, we're going to show them that we love them. We're going to speak truth to them. You are the ministers of Calvary Chapel Eldoret. Don't think you need a title, pastor, apostle, prophet, deacon, Sunday school worker. All, all okay. You don't need a title to go out and share the, how much you love somebody and how much you want them to believe in the real gospel of Jesus Christ. The apostle Paul here in Romans 10 is pouring out his heart. Romans chapter 9 was the past condition of Israel. Romans 10 is the present condition at that time. And Romans 11 will be the future reality of the nation of Israel, a time that we are living in and as we observe and look at the nation of Israel. He's praying for them. 
I've told this story before, I'll tell you again, that while uh, an unbeliever, me, I was just in the world. I, I only sought after pleasure. That's all I wanted. I wanted pleasure. I wanted drugs to make me feel good. I wanted alcohol to make me get high and, and pleasure and partying and all of that stuff. And my mom suffered because of this because I had overdosed on heroin 10 different times where I injected the heroin into my body through an IV or through a needle. Um, no training for, for that needed if you need help. Um, not for, for heroin, I'll, I'll inject like fluids or antibiotics or something. And, and I got, and, um, one night I overdosed on heroin, I was being rushed to the hospital. My mom was at a restaurant and at this restaurant, it was kind of a nicer restaurant. She went in, there was a maitre d' in the restroom, an older woman. And she said to my mother, because my mom was crying in the, in the, in the bathroom, she, my mom didn't know if I was going to live or die. The phone call that she received, we don't know if he's going to live or die, but he's not breathing. He's completely purple. They were rushing me to the hospital. So this woman prayed with my mom and said she would pray for me. And two years later, same restaurant, same bathroom, my mom went into forgetting about that whole bathroom and said, the same woman working in the bathroom. Came to my mom and said, hey, how's Josh doing? I've been praying for him every day for two years. That is a woman who gets to take part in the inheritance with Christ in my salvation. Prayer. Are we praying for the lost? You say you love your colleague. You say you love your children. You say you love your friends and family. Are you praying for them? Paul isn't just saying, I love the nation of Israel and want them to be saved. He's saying, I pray to God that they would be saved. And in the other epistles, the apostle Paul is saying, I pray daily for you. He would say, many times in his epistles. Understand something about Calvary Chapel Elder, and I hope this is your heart. We want people to be born again. In unity, we must believe this. So he goes on. And he says in verse 2, for I bear witness, and let me read the whole chapter, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them, but the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach? Unless they are sent, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. 
But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed. Their sound has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. But I say, did Israel not know? First Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. But Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me, and I was made manifest to those who do not ask for me. But to Israel, he says, all day long I have stretched out my hand to a disobedient and contrary people. Now, before you think of the nation of Israel as a disobedient and contrary people, just include all of us in that as well. A stiff-necked, stubborn, disobedient, contrary people. What is happening in the book of Romans, and that's why we're able to cover three chapters in three weeks, is the Apostle Paul is culminating all the doctrine of eight chapters into, yes, he's talking about doctrine, but he's going on to the application of that doctrine and the refusal to submit to the truth. That's what he's doing in this chapter. In chapter 9, so many avoid it because of all the theological controversies, which I also disagree with certain people, and they disagree with me, and that's fine. But I refuse to look at chapter 9 and actually believe that... God has um, created people for hell and he's created people for heaven and those going to heaven are the elect and those who are going to hell are vessels of dishonor. I don't agree with it. I think it is a ridiculous doctrine and I think it's totally unbiblical and not hermeneutically, that's interpretation of scripture, sound with the context of the book of Romans or chapter nine. Do I believe in, in predestination? Yes. Do I believe in that there is an elect, yes. Do I believe any of us have figured out exactly how to define that? No, and I also don't think it's a cop-out to not try to understand it, but it is clear in Romans 9 that the Jews, in all of their attempts in righteousness, are upset that God is widening the scope of the election to all the world. That is to the Gentile people. Not narrowing it, not saying, oh, don't worry, there's going to be some of you that are elect and some of you that aren't, and just let God choose. No, it's God has chosen the nation of Israel to be saved. He has chosen them to be his people. He has chosen them to be the very means by which Jesus Christ would be born. And now that Christ has been born, And that he has lived a sinless, perfect life, becoming qualified to be an all-sufficient Savior, dying on the cross for our sins. He is saying to the whole world, I invite you all, I invite you Jew, I invite you Gentile to be born again. What must I do? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, whosoever believes Whosoever in verse 13 that calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Stop this theological debating about who won't and who is. And that, that, we don't know. God knows. God knows who will be saved. He's predetermined through his foreknowledge exactly who will be in heaven. Until then, every single person has the opportunity and every single person is a candidate for us to share the gospel with. Just um, on, on, uh, on Friday, most of my life in Kenya has been right here in Eldoret, right at church all the time. I work Tuesday through Sunday. I only take one day off a week. I believe, in the, I believe personally in the Old Testament principle of working six days and resting one. Now, that's not to say it's wrong to rest two. That's just what I do. And uh, f- for that reason, I haven't traveled as much as many people have traveled throughout Kenya. And 
one of our members, one of my friends, he was having a, essentially an a initiation into madhood, and listen to this, to his 13-year-old son. Stop calling 20-year-old men in Kenya boys. It is offensive. That was just a side, passionate, like, personal thing that uh, I don't understand culturally. I even had a guy come in on, um, on, on uh, Friday. You know, we allowed the basketball guys to come in. At the, at the time, these guys were adults. Some of them were 30 years old. And this guy comes in, he's like, I really want to have a ministry to these boys. I'm like, if you want to have a ministry to these boys, stop calling them boys. Because when you call a man a boy, he's not going to like it. Right, guys? Are you afraid of the mosaics? Just say yes. <clears throat> so I went up on this hike, and it's not far, and um, just 30 minutes away, you can hike this hill, and you can see all of Eldoret. And guys, you know how beautiful Eldoret is? Do you know how amazing the city? We could get down to Kisumo, Kisumu, and it's so hot down there. You guys know what I'm talking about. Many of you from Kisumu, or if you get off to Mombasa, it is so hot. In Eldoret, we have the best weather in the world. And then you look out, and it's like this breadbasket, it's green. So we're looking out at the city of Eldoret. And as I have often done numerous times in the past when I'm up on a high mountain or hill overlooking a city, I did it, uh, I did it in uh, Paris recently. All I can think of in Eldoret, there's 800,000 people down there, most of whom are not born again. Most of whom don't know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Do you know what kind of glorious burden, what kind of glorious privilege we have to share with them who Jesus Christ is? We need to stop and say, don't worry about who's elect and who's not. To share the gospel, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And chapter 9 is, is about that. It's, it's about the love of God. He says, I have every right to call whom I will or not call whom I won't. And I call upon the Gentile people to know who I am and to be born again. For they are a part of humanity, my creation, born in my image, and I love them. That's the God that we serve. But Paul says... That they have a zeal not according to knowledge. There in verse 3. Verse 2. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness. Having to establish their own righteousness. And have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law. And righteousness to everyone who believes. They're passionate. Paul, you can hear the heart of an evangelist. You can hear the heart of somebody who's come into contact with the real Jesus Christ. And he is saying, I know how much you've tried. I get it. We don't need to be mean to unbelievers. We don't need to be so arrogant that in our evangelism, we're actually just trying to be right rather than actually addressing their soul and letting them know how much we love them. These Muslims, they are trying to be right, many of them. They're misguided. Many Hindus, there are all kinds of people who are trying to be right with God or with their gods. They have sincere beliefs. That's what Paul's saying. He's saying, I understand how hard you've worked, how hard you've tried, how passionate and zealous you are. And nobody's a better example than that than the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was so zealous for the God of the Old Testament, which is the God of the New Testament, but he didn't know, that he actually was complicit in murder and in the imprisonment of the followers of Christ. That's how zealous he was. And he says, hey, I, I get it. I was zealous too. But your zeal and my zeal was without knowledge. 
We have a tendency, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, to be impressed with passionate people. Um, Passionate people in religious circles or passionate people in worldly circles. And here's a point for you if you're writing notes. Point one, don't be passionate or don't be impressed with passionate people if their passion is without knowledge and, and submission to truth. Don't. It, it, we do that in church, don't we? Guys, just because there are a lot of heretics in the world and in Africa doesn't mean they're not impressive orators or, or communicators or entertainers. They're impressive people. They bop around stage. They change their voice. It's amusing. It's entertaining, isn't it? And I've, I know I've mimicked it in the past. You know, these people who are, hey, and they, they get the crowd going, and it, it can be exciting. Like, and, and people leave church that day, and they're like, whoo, that was a good service. Whoo, that guy, I have no idea what he was saying, but it was good. He was passionate when he said it. And they could tell you nothing about the message five hours after it, other than just give some more money, and you'll have favor. Passion without knowledge is dangerous. You know, we have a magazine that doesn't ship internationally because it takes so long, and um, I'm going to start seeing a way that we can get it. You guys know that Calvary Chapel Magazine, it's an incredible magazine. They did a story on our church. Remember that? When we had the Calvary Magazine here some months ago? Well, it just came out. I hope to bring like a thousand copies um, to, uh, to, 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 to give to all our members, there is a 15-page article in the magazine about Calvary Chapel Eldoret. It's the longest article I've ever seen in the magazine. And, and you know what? The title of the magazine, and I didn't title it. This was them. It says, Miracle in Eldoret, Kenya. Isn't that cool? Well, one of the, the guy who, was, uh, uh, who worked for the magazine who came, Billy Rutledge, maybe some of you remember him, he came and he says, this is a work of God. I know it is for many reasons. Number one is you are not running around on stage preaching in the way that I've seen so many preach in Africa. He has done a lot of missions in Africa. And he's talking about what I made reference to a few moments ago. That in order to really love Calvary Chapel, you have to love the Word of God because I don't exist on Sunday morning to entertain you like so many ministries do. My existence is to try to get out of the way as much as possible and cover a lot of Bible. That's what we do. And if you guys come here, and I've had people do this, by the way, it's like, you know what? I... Calvary Chapel is boring. You know how many people have said that to me? Because I'm not on stage like, eh! And I'm like, why is it boring? It's, and I, I, I tried to get down to it once. It's like, why is it so boring for you? I was speaking to one lady about eight years ago. She says, it's just so much Bible. <laughs> That's what she said to me. And even when the words were coming out of her mouth, she realized how bad it sounded. She's like, oh, let me grab them. Let me grab them. Let me put them back in. That's not what I meant to say. No. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's exactly what you meant to say. And if you don't love the scripture, you will not love our church for very long. You will just end up coming because you like the music and then eventually you will fade out. What's going to sustain you is not the harmonies that the worship team sings. What's going to sustain you in your life is the word of God. That was, we, it's, it's like we have 90% Anglicans. That was definitely an amen moment. You can speak. Sorry, that's not to diss Anglicans. You guys are just so proper. I know which ones used to be Anglicans because you're sitting up in your chair very straight. And when hymns, when we start singing hymns, you start singing. Uh, 
It's without knowledge. It's without knowledge. They have a passion. So that point, don't be passionate with religious people whose passion is not based in truth. Secondly, don't be impressed with the passion of the world. You ever notice that worship and churches, people, a lot of the times they close their eyes when they worship. It's kind of, it can be a good thing. You want to just focus on God. And if you can't focus on God with your eyes, without your eyes being closed, close them and that's fine. But you know something I've noticed? Worldly people will close their eyes when they're singing music, when the music has nothing to do with a God or their God or the true God. Have you ever noticed this? You'll get Whitney Houston on stage and be like, and they'll close their eyes. It's like, you're singing to Kevin Costner, not Jesus Christ. What are you talking about? Because they have a passion for what they do. They have a passion for good music. They're passionate people. Passion is a part of humanity. Has anybody ever seen the movie, The Greatest Showman? I'm, not, I'm normally not into musicals, but this one was pretty good. You have? There's some bad philosophy in it, but man, the music. This one lady in the music, and many of you have seen it by the show of your hands, she sang the song called Never Enough. You know the song? Never enough. Oh, they, they do. <laughs> Woo. It's, it's a very, you know, uh, it, 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 the first time I heard it, you're just like, this is the greatest song ever written. Well, I was so impressed with the song that I wanted to know who wrote it. I wanted to know um, if this lady sang it. I discovered that the woman acting in the movie, she lip synced the song. That's not her voice. That just crushed your dreams, didn't it? Lip synced the song. And then as I was reading the story of what this woman did, she practiced for 80 hours just to lip sync the song in the movie in a three minute scene. When I heard this, I came to our worship team and I was like, guys, there is no way that a secular woman singing a secular song about a man is ever gonna have more passion than my love and knowledge for Jesus Christ. So we're gonna practice. 15 times before a Christmas service, around three-hour practices before we do it. And that's when we establish the 15 practices before Christmas Eve. She, she, D.L. Moody said that the tinker better not be up working for his uh, uh, daily wage before I'm up praying for lost souls. It's without knowledge. Don't be impressed with the world, guys. They have a passion without knowledge. Don't be impressed with false teachers, even if they're entertaining as much as they are. It's a passion without knowledge. And that's what Paul is saying. Guys, I understand that you have a passion. I understand you have a zeal, but it's without knowledge. For the greatest zeal you should have is for truth. And the truth is, Jesus Christ is our righteousness. We have no righteousness of our own. You've tried and you've, you've fall. You've fallen. You have failed. You can't be right with God. And that's why he goes on for Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. Okay, so you want a righteousness without knowledge? You want a righteousness without Christ? Then you've got to look to the law of Moses. You got to look at the Ten Commandments and you got to say, hey, obey those. For him who wants to uh, have his own righteousness must live by the law of God. Now, th guys, that's not to say after we get saved and accept the righteousness of Christ, we don't obey the law of God. But understand the context and point here. He's, he goes on and he's like, hey, you got to obey this perfectly to be right with God. So, so, don't commit adultery. You're bound by the law of Moses. Have you lusted? Don't murder. You're bound by the law of Moses. Do you hate people? Have you, have you for unforgiveness in your heart? You know? Uh, have you keeping the Sabbath day, which is, by the, uh, by the way, about Jesus Christ? 
all of these. Have you done that? And that's why the, the rich young ruler comes to Jesus. What must I do to be saved? Jesus Christ says, okay, you have idolatry in your heart. Sell all that you have, follow me, give it to the poor. He went away sorrowful because he had much possessions. He was letting this guy know, you can't be saved unless you follow me. And your heart condition is idolatry. You love money and what it can give you, the power of it, more than you love God. He always goes, Jesus Christ goes to the law of the Lord, which is good in converting the soul. Another guy comes up. Do you remember? The lawyer, which means not some lawyer in this courtroom, but a lawyer who is a scholar of the law of Moses. And he says, what must I do to be saved? Jesus Christ says, well, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, as a good lawyer in the law of Moses, he already believed that he loved the Lord his God with all of his heart, mind, soul, and strength by obeying the law of Moses. And then he says, okay, but that's interesting. Who is my neighbor? Your neighbor is your enemy. Your neighbor is a Gentile. Your neighbor is a Samaritan. He gave us the parable of the Good Samaritan. The best way you can identify a true conversion is have they truly repented of their sins? And one of the ways to identify that is how do we treat our enemies? It's easy for you to love your wife and children. They love you back. Do you love those who hate you? That is one of the greatest manifestations of Christ that you could ever display or show people if you are truly born again. And so, this righteousness, if you're going to live by that, then you have to live by that and you have to be perfect. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does these things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth, in your heart. This is the word of faith which we preach. This is incredible. The Jews are saying, hey, okay, fine. We had no knowledge. Okay, now you've given us the knowledge. We can't save ourselves. It's been this common theme, guys, in Romans from chapter one to where we are right now. And I, and I really want you to listen to this next part because it's vitally important. If you're sitting there and you're, and you're saying to yourself, ah, oh, this is so repetitive. We're in the book of Romans. It's just a continued theme. We can't be saved through our own works. We can't be saved by our own righteousness. We believe. We get it. Let me tell you something. We don't get it. We don't get it, guys. For the person who gets it will be as powerful as the Apostle Paul. And I don't even think he got it 100%. Because getting something in our mind is different than getting it in our heart, is different than getting it from our heart down to our feet and walking in a way that would actually declare all of our focus, all of our righteousness, all of our goodness is in Christ. How do I know that? Because when we do something bad, we feel like we should be punished. When we do something good, we feel like we should be rewarded. We get condemned when we do something bad. And we get angry when we're not rewarded when we do something good. And it is a vicious cycle over and over and over and over again in all of our lives. And listen, guys, I want you to know... I believe in prophecy 100%. Why? Because I believe in Christ. Why? Because his word has been proven to be true. I'm just looking for the signs of Ezekiel 38. I'm looking for Russia to spearhead an attack with Iran. Is it happening right now? No, we don't hear about Russia in this conflict yet. 
Can you, do you think it, it's unreal that Russia could, we could hear on the news Russia joined Iran? If that happens, man. And, and, I, and guys, it stirred within me yesterday. You know, I went to my room, I got on my knees, I started praying. I started trying to confess every sin I've ever done. It's like, Lord, uh, I know you're returning. Uh, it seems like pretty soon. Will you forgive me? <laughs> Why? Because I have a deep, deep propensity to be fearful because that fear is born out of what I do for Christ. What I do for him. That's dangerous. Now, there's nothing wrong with me confessing my sins. I should. But I shouldn't have a fear whether or not Jesus Christ's blood really saves me and whether I have a real destination in heaven. Because I'm going to tell you something. When I get those feelings aside, I'm like, gosh, okay, this reward and punishment, reward and punishment, reward and punishment. He loves me. He died on the cross because I sinned. And my assurance is in him and not myself. I'm going to heaven. When the roll, they clapped. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. You guys know that song? We got to sing that. If you know, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder. You know, the only person that just started enjoying was people over 50 years old. You young people need to learn these old songs. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. All right. I believe that. Why? Because I need to stop looking at myself and I look to the cross of Jesus Christ. And we hear it. You guys know that we are one of the few churches that has this message, even though this message is so clear. Because many of us have gone to those churches, haven't we? No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, of course God loves you, but if you got to pay to pray. You want favor? Make sure you give a lot of money. Oh, 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 oh. Are you telling me your cousin just got cancer? There's a witch doctor in the village somewhere who has a curse on you and your cousin. And we hear this at churches. I just heard uh, just this week, talking to a friend, a member of our church. He's had the worst back. It's so painful at times he can barely walk. And he's always telling one of his neighbors, who's a Seventh-day Adventist? Seventh-day Adventist. If you don't think they're superstitious, they are. Don't worship the beast. You know, just a little funny joke for you. I, I do this every time I invite a Seventh-day Adventist to Calvary. I say, hey, you should come to our church, man. You really should. Hear the word of God. You got, and they're like, I'm Seventh-day Adventist. I say, that's perfect. That means you're available on Sundays. So he's hearing this constant nagging in the back of my friend. And this guy says, there's probably been witchcraft put upon you by somebody in Kenya. You need to, you need to release the curse of witchcraft and your back will be healed. You know what that is? That's bad news. It's also bad news to think in order to have favor with God, you have to give money. Now, you should, because you're selfish if you don't, but you don't have to. Guys, God loves us. He died on the cross even while we were yet, what? Sinners. This is good news. We have, we're one of those churches who have the best news. It's the news of true knowledge. We go out into elder and we say, God loves you. He loves you, all of you. And you don't got to pay to pray, and you don't got to crawl up steps on, Roman, on Peter's cathedral in Rome to make your knees bleed to be right with God, and there's no purgatory, and God just loves you, and he wants to save you, and he wants you to know him, and, and when the roll is called up yonder, you'll be there if you do this, and he's going to tell us. He's going to tell us what it is, because at this point in this chapter, 
these guys are like, fine. We, okay, f- just throw centuries of obeying Moses' law out the window. What do we do? Do we got to go up to heaven and bring him down? Do we got to go in the, Im- the abyss and bring him up? Do, there's got to be, do you, do you get what's happening here? What we read? There's got to be something. There's got to be something. Have you guys ever, this is just kind of a weird thought, but have you ever accidentally, you've been joking around with one of your friends and, 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 you, and you, like, you threw like a rock at him and you accidentally hit him in the eye or something? Have you guys done that, something stupid like that? You guys remember Pastor Lloyd Pulley was here? I was at a conference. I meant to hit him in the chest with a big walnut. No, it was an almond, and I chucked that almond, and usually I'm a good aim. I meant to hit him. I hit him right between the eyes, <laughs> and it was hard, and he goes, Josh, what did you do that for? I felt so bad. You guys ever had a moment like that? I felt so bad. I'm like, ah, please, please, slap me in the face. Would you? Here, here's an almond. Throw it in my face. Have you ever done that? You want to be punished, right? You want to pay for what you've done. It's just our natural tendency to do this, guys. And, and now these Jews are like, fine, okay, we can't obey the law. I see that. There's, some, there's truth in what you're saying. Christ was perfect. We saw, we saw him. Innocent. We get it. What do we got to do, though? What do we, we got to do? Okay, we can't obey the law. There's got to be something. Do you want us to go to heaven? We'll, we'll invent a rocket ship. NASA, invent a rocket ship. We got to bring Jesus down. Oh, he's down there? We got to vent a, a, a drill machine. Get technology together. Let's go down there and find God. Paul's saying, no, 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 you, you're not getting it. It's by faith. And they're not satisfied. They're not satisfied. They're like, by faith? Okay. Faith. What's faith to you? What does faith mean? Oh, What does it mean? That's what it says here. (laughs) What am I saying, the Apostle Paul says here? What? But what does it say? Oh, the word is near you. Where is it? It's in your mouth. You don't got to go to space. You don't got to go to the core of the earth. Salvation. It's by faith. It's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Oh, wait a minute. I I just confess with my mouth. I submit to the righteousness of Christ with my mind. It comes out my mouth. Then I submit in my heart. And then I submit with my feet. We're, we're born again. Then we're sent. Because how can somebody hear this word if somebody's not sent? That's how. I was sharing at a mosque years ago in Langus. And I was sharing Romans chapter 10 with this Muslim. With the imam. And when I was getting through this, I, I got through these, chap- these verses. I'm like, this is what it says. You don't have righteousness, bro, that can save you. I know you're trying. It's evident by you being here and you you doing the call to prayer. I know you're trying to be right with God, but it's without knowledge. You must recognize Christ. And and he actually said that. He's like, all right, well, what do I got to do? You got to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is the Christ and that God raised him from the dead for it was the confession in the heart. He, He looks at me and he goes, that's too easy. That can't be true, he said, because it's too easy. You know what I said to him? Oh, no. It's not easy. It's not easy at all. Because they took a scourge. And they deformed his body, ripping out large portions of skin. 
And then they took a crown of thorns and they ripped it across his face. And then they nailed him to the cross and every ounce of blood was poured out of his body. That's not easy. He's made it easy for you because you couldn't save yourself and he loves you. It was difficult, guys. There's no cheap grace here. If you're here today and you've been brought up in this religious system of works and works and worse and do something right and you'll get rewarded, do something wrong and you'll be punished, let me tell you something. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. True repentance. How then shall they call on him who they've not believed and how shall they believe on whom they've not heard and how shall they hear without a preacher and how shall they preach unless they are sent as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of priests Peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they've not obeyed the gospel. And he goes on about the prophecy in Isaiah, talking about the stubbornness of Israel and the rejection of Israel, of their Messiah. And then he talks about, in Isaiah's prophecy, I, will f- I-, I was found by those, God says, who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. But to Israel, he says, all day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Let me tell you something. As the worship team comes up, they're not the only ones that are disobedient and contrary. We are too. And there are even some in this room who have not confessed Christ and believe in their heart because of disobedience and contrariness. Guys, I share the gospel all the time. We have basketball outreach. We have dozens and dozens, sometimes a couple, maybe a hundred or more people that will come in here on Wednesdays and Fridays. We do Bible study uh, with them. We pray with them. We pray for them. Some have gotten born again. Most haven't. Most are in complete rebellion against God. And I've, some of these guys I've known for years now. And I'm just sick at how stubborn can you be? You don't need, you're not fighting the truth. You may believe that this is wrong, but you know deep down that you're a sinner and you need a savior and Jesus Christ is his name. What are you doing? And there are a few reasons why people are disobedient and contrary. One of the big ones is they are prideful. They want to earn their right to be with God. Uh, Number two, it's just, this is the big one. People want to be in a life of pleasure. It's a life of pleasure. I'm 19, 20, 21, 25, 27 years old, and I want fun. I want pleasure. I know God doesn't want me to fornicate with my girlfriend. I know I'm in a come and stay relationship contrary, disobedient, stubborn, just like the nation of Israel. If you're here today and you have not been born again, confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God raised him from the dead. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Believe that. And then, for the rest of us, ladies and gentlemen, we take those feet and they become beautiful when we walk out of church on Sundays and we go throughout this week, we share the good news. Go into town, tell your colleagues, say, hey, come to our church. You never have to pay to receive prayer there. Hey, come to our church. You This whole favor, God helps those who help themselves, they're going to help us even when we're sinful and God still loves us. He wants us to change. He wants us to repent. Yes. Guys, this is good news that we have and we ought to go into the world to share it. Amen?
Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for how liberating it is. You've set us free. You've placed our feet on solid ground. The rock Christ Jesus, who is our righteousness, who is our joy, and who is our salvation. This is good news. We thank you for it, Lord. And I pray for anybody here right now who was not born again or who was backslidden, that your Holy Spirit would fall upon them. Save them, oh God. Maybe they're young. They're so focused on pleasure. Maybe they're old and they've been so worried that they have not ever really looked at you and have their worries be under the submission of your love and your truth. I pray your Holy Spirit would fall upon them. Save them. Save the lost, Lord. Turn them into sheep from goats. Thank you for the privilege to give, Lord. It is our joy. Not for favor. Not for a ten-seed blessing. But because we love you, we give. And we believe that this gospel should continue to go out through this city. Receive it as an act of love. For those who have prepared, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Would you all stand on your feet as the deacons and ushers come forward to receive the offering? And let's sing with all of our hearts this last song together. <laughs>